Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 17th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, after looking at the summaries published by each, we discuss how far both the administration and the Legislative Finance Division already are straying from truth in budgeting this session. Second, in the wake of Angela Rodell's termination, we explain our thoughts on the steps needed going forward to depoliticize the governance of the Permanent Fund. And third, we discuss the harm to Alaska from the continued treatment of the NPRA as a political football by both Democrats and Republican administrations. And now, let's join Michael. The legislative session starts today, so no more empty news days. It'll be wall-to-wall craziness and stupidity for the next uh, 90 days at least, probably 120. Uh, but before we get into that, I guess we should take a look at what's going on. You've got a deeper analysis. Last week you talked about a few of the budget gimmicks and a few of the things that the governor had put into his budget that, you know, he basically put it into the budget backing information, the the bit, you know, the footnotes, so to speak, and didn't include any of it in his plan. And you have di- you know dove down a little bit deeper on that and find even more some of the more of these gimmicks. Let's start off there. Well, I've spent uh, I spent the last week uh, looking not only at the governor's budget but also at uh, legislative finance uh, uh, divisions uh, analysis of the governor's budget. They do an annual when the governor's budget comes out. They do a an analysis of the budget that, frankly, is is pretty helpful um, in identifying uh, 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 various aspects of the budget that might otherwise be overlooked. Uh, but legislative finance itself then uh, engages in uh, some budget gimmicks that uh, that that are questionable. I mean, last week we did we talked about some of the gimmicks that are in the governor's budget, and, and let's put this in context. You remember when the governor was elected. Uh, one of his uh, one of his standards at the beginning was truth and budgeting. Right, we're going right, to put right. all out on the table. We're going to have everything uh, uh, honestly presented, and we've sort of slid away from that over the last uh, well, over the last. As four soon years. as Donna Arduin was gone, I think that that kind of slid back under because I think she was shining the light on too many truths, and people were like, stu- du- 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 they were stuttering, and as soon as she was gone, they're like, sweep that stuff back under the carpet again. Well, we, we mentioned some of the stuff in the governor's budget. Uh, he has a stealth uh, PFD cut in there. He converts the PFD from the statutory PFD to uh, POMV 5050, which is about a 500 to $600 million per year budget cut, about a 25% uh, cut in the budget. And, and you don't, there's nothing in the governor's budget that, that, that shows that cut and shows the diversion and use of, as a revenue source uh, to make uh, the governor's budget uh, uh, balance uh, as well as it does. Um, and and so, you know, that's one thing that we talked about last week. Second thing is the unrealistic inflation adjustments. He adjusts the, the, the budget by 1%, well, overall less than 1% per year, adjusts certain items by 1% per year. Uh, when inflation's running at, well, it's running at, you know, six or seven now, but over the course of the 10-year period, it's projected to run at two, two and a half uh, percent. And so uh, that's another thing that's really, you know, uh, questionable in the, in the governor's uh, budget. And then Ledge Finance identifies a couple of other things. One is uh, the governor includes uh, reductions in the retirement 
um, contributions that are required uh, over the course of uh, the 10 year period. Uh, alleged finance highlights that uh, a significant share of that is due to the adoption by the ARM board, the Alaska Retirement Management Board, uh, of, uh, of changes that, that they themselves identified as a one year change. Uh, the governor's budget extends that over 10 years and just assumes they continue that. And there's no guarantee at all uh, that uh, that that would continue. That has an effect on the on the budget. And then uh, uh, the governor's budget fails to include uh, the the state uh, match that's going to be required for the infrastructure funding. There's a lot of discussion about how much uh, infrastructure funding is going to be coming into the state. There was an article in the ADM this past week about how much is coming in for bridges, for example, over the next five years. Uh, that's going to require state match funds, uh, but there's nothing in the governor's budget that uh, that includes those state match funds. So it understates uh, expenses for that. So that's, I mean, so, so we, we've got a budget that is sort of directionally maybe sort of uh, correct, uh, but there's a lot of adjustments in there, particularly the stealth uh, uh, PFD cut. Uh, that the governor's budget that's, that doesn't quite match up to the truth in budgeting. Over on the legislative finance side, uh, the one that the one that really gets me on the legislative finance side uh, is um, uh, is highlighted in a footnote uh, to uh, to their fiscal summary. Uh, here's here's how the footnote reads: Restricted revenue equals spending for each category. Designated general funds include program receipts that are restricted to the to the program that generates the street, the, the 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 receipts and revenue that is statutorily designated for a specific purpose. <laughs> Wait a minute. Revenue designated funds equal statutory equal uh, revenues that are statutorily statutorily designated for a specific purpose. Wait a second. There is no there is no more fund. There there is there is a no more a fund that qualifies for that than the PFD. Right. And if you put the PFD over in DGF, over in designated general funds, as opposed to unrestricted general funds, as ledge finance has done since 2017, you get an entirely different view um, uh, of the budget. You see the portion that's supposed to go to government in the UGF, and you see the portion that's supposed to go to the PFD in DGF, in DGF, in designated general funds. And you see a much lower revenue level for government uh, by doing it that way than you do the, the, the way they've done it since, uh, since 2017. It is, it is a trick, a budget gimmick uh, that uh, uh, the uh, ledge finance has done since 2017 that violates their own standards, their own, uh, their own uh, footnotes. And, uh, and I think that has a significant, uh, it's, not, it's, not just, it's not just an accounting change, it's a change that changes the tenor of the conversation and clearly is something that uh, that is done to fit the narrative of uh, particularly the Senate finance co-chairs, but also the House finance co-chairs. Uh, and I and I it, it, it is and is and is an inappropriate, I think, uh, uh, reclassification uh, inconsistent with their with their own uh, with their own uh, uh, requirements. Well, uh, the other thing is that in legislative fine in the legislative finance, they talk about uh, potential revenue sources. Um, and, and include this sentence. Uh, they recommend that, quote, equity, economic impacts, efficiency, and other considerations should be addressed if the legislature chooses to explore revenue options. Well, the legislature has chosen a big revenue option, which is the diversion of, <laughs> of permanent, fund, uh, uh, permanent fund dividend revenues uh, over to government. But there's no analysis in the budget whatsoever uh, of of the uh, equity, economic impacts, efficiency, uh, and other considerations uh, that should go along with it. So, it's um, uh, what you're seeing, I think, from both sides uh, is is the use of budget gimmicks that that distort uh, the the budget uh, that we're seeing uh, seeing in front of us. Well, I mean, I want to I want to rewind here just for a second, Brad. Um, read me the first line uh, of that. Uh, read me the first line of that uh, footnote to begin with, because I mean I would like to point something out, but I want to make sure that I didn't mishear what you just said. So reread the reread the first line of that uh, of that uh, uh, footnote. 
where it was talking. Well, the first the first line is restricted revenue equals spending for each category. The, I think the sentence you're, you're yeah the second the second sentence then yeah. So designated general funds include program receipts that are restricted to the program that generates the receipts and revenue that is statutorily designated for a specific purpose. So, I mean, according to the Alaska Constitution, there are no dedicated funds. If money is pulled in, um, it all is supposed to go into the general fund and then be, uh, uh, you know, appropriated out of that fund. There is no, oh, my program generated this fund, this amount of money, so this money needs to be spent on my program. That's not how it works. That's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says it goes into the bucket and we appropriate it after discussion on an as-needed basis. They're literally trying to rewrite the Constitution of the state of Alaska in these footnotes. Well, they're, they're using the term designated as opposed to dedicated. And but, but in the, the budgeting the process, same, right? that's, come to, that, that's come to mean that the statute, statutes, I mean, like the PFD, I mean, the stat, PFD right. is a perfect example of this. The statute says the funds that are supposed to be used for that purpose. Now, the legislature can change the use of that fund. I mean, that's what the 2017 uh, Supreme Court decision on the PFD uh, was about. But the they they the stat some statutes do designate the use of funds for certain for certain purposes. So it's that that category is not trying to override the constitution. It's simply saying some of these some of the statutes some of the funds uh, are are designated by statute for uh, for a certain use. But we get the, and, this, and, the semantics and, and, of dedicated versus designated. I mean, if it's effectively the same thing, I mean, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, is it a duck? Yeah, it's not really. I mean, because you can, you can, uh, you, the legislature can change the use of designated funds. They're doing it with the PFD. The problem, Michael, is is we're not seeing. I mean, the problem is the is the is the is the un uh, un un uh, designation uh, of of the PFD uh, by legislative right. finance when the right. statute clearly says that they're to be treated as des- as designated funds. If we treated them as designated funds, the way that the footnote and the way that the standards, the legislative finance is supposed to be applying, if we treated them as as as, as designated funds, you would see a lot smaller funds in the in the unrestricted general fund, which would lead one to start talking about spending cuts. Right. Because you would you wouldn't have a balanced budget. What they're trying to do is avoid the discussion about spending cuts by violating their own rules taking the PFD and sticking it over into uh, uh, into uh, uh, unrestricted general funds. <clears throat> so essentially they're picking and choosing the statute that they want to follow at that point. They're basically ignoring the statutory designation for the PFD, but following the statutory designation for all these other programs. Exactly. If you mesh, the, if you, if you, if you combine the designated and the unrestricted general funds together, you, you would get a picture that would show that you have enough revenues to cover your spending. I mean, that's what they're trying. The, the big, the big number out there is the, is the PFD. And if you mesh those two together, what you would show is you have enough revenues and there wouldn't be the pressure for spending cuts. What they're trying to do by bringing the PFD over, but not anything else uh, is say, Oh, well, we got enough revenues for all this spending. We don't really need to worry about additional revenues because we've got enough unrestricted uh, general fund revenues to cover all this spending. If they followed the rules and put the PFD where it's supposed to be in DGF and designated general funds, all of a sudden you would see a budget that can't pay for itself and you would have pressure uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to do spending cuts. So it's, um, I, I mean, they're trying, they're trying to over, it's not the constitution they're trying to override. They're trying to override a statutory designation uh, by, by simply slipping numbers from one category, the PFD numbers from one category to the other. What's our solution here? I mean, what could we do to, uh, to take this information and make it useful to weaponize it, so to speak? Well, I think, I think, you know, when we talk about the budgets, we break, we break the, the PFD out into, into DGF and unrestricted general funds. It would be useful if uh, members of the finance committees, both uh, in the house and in the Senate, at least some members, pushed back and said, look, you know, we're, we're misreporting uh, these numbers uh, by including uh, the PFD in the UGF portion and then talk about uh, the numbers that would result if you didn't slide 
uh, the PFDL over. So in terms of listeners, uh, if you want to contact your representatives, your senators, particularly ones on the finance committees, uh, to make that point, I think it's uh, I think it's useful to do so. That that one slip, that the slip of that one num number uh, over to unrestricted general funds leads to things like the ADN saying, "Oh, uh, uh, permanent fund revenues support two thirds of budget of government spending." Uh, uh, oil covers the other third, you know, we're close to being, we're close to covering our spending once we, once we have those, once we count the, the permanent fund under restricted general funds. If you, if the, if the, if ledge finance appropriately treated by their own footnote, by their own standards, if they appropriately treated uh, the permanent fund dividend revenues over in DGF, uh, you wouldn't see articles like that because you would be showing this huge uh, deficit over on the uh, over on the UGF side. Uh, I've included a link in the chat room to the uh, document that Brad has been talking about. You should share this with your legislative representatives and ask them to encourage them to track the PFD as they do other statutory programs. I want to go back to this. I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, Brad, but I mean, <laughs> again, the semantics of designated versus dedicated and what they're doing here. I mean, I understand what you're saying is that there are certain funds that they have taken to say, look, the statutes say this. But overall, the Constitution does say that there can be no dedicated funds. Now, they've gotten cutesy with it over the last 35 years, and they've started calling things designated instead of dedicated. Uh, but that essentially means that it does not have the constitutional root of it, right? I mean, that's how they got around it, was with the definition and the verbiage. But essentially... In the long run, it's the same thing. They're they're trying to dedicate these funds to say, well, you can't do that. That's going to the power cost equalization fund, or you can't do that because that's good. And and that is the problem: is that they're through this verbiage, they've slowly morphed it until they can designate anything, and it has the effect of dedicated funds, right? Yeah, I don't I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with designating funds because you know you can always go grab them if you. If you if you decide to do so, but what I really have a problem with is treating everything other than the permanent fund, uh, which which is which meets the yeah. definition of designated oh, yeah. fund, treating everything but the permanent fund um, uh, as as designated. I mean, it's it's the it's the it's the the disparate treatment of the permanent fund uh, and grabbing that and bringing that over to UGF that I think uh, that I think is the source of the problem. There, if if it were treated, if the permanent fund were treated as it had been for years and years, decades indeed, up until 2017, if it were treated as designated or sometimes it was treated as other, if the permanent fund were treated that way, I think we I think the use of DGF would be would be helpful uh, in the budgeting process because you're seeing over on the DGF side, you're seeing revenues that have been designated by statute for a certain purpose. It's the it's the it's the violation of those rules to go grab the permanent fund and suddenly undesignate them by by accounting trick, by budget trick, by legislative finance division uh, 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 undoing. Uh, it's it's that that I think uh, that's the that's the problem. Oh, I get your equity argument. I, I have no problem. I understand what you're saying, that all things should be treated equally under the DGF designation. I, I mean, I'm not arguing that. But I'm saying that the average person doesn't understand the average Alaskan, probably not the listeners to these shows, but the average Alaskan doesn't understand the difference between designated and dedicated. And to them, it's probably interchangeable. And when the news stories are written, they think, oh, well, that money has to go to that project. So now that's hands off. And see, that to me, that's the problem. This slow, sly manipulation of the language over the last you know three decades to where they made that happen. And it flies contrary to what the Constitution actually says. And that's what bothers me more than anything else. That's fair, Michael. But 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 think about it in the construct of the PFD. I mean, I, I think it I, if the PFD were treated as the rules require it should be, I think that would be a very useful thing, because then people would say, "Oh, the permanent fund dividend is set aside. The government can go grab it if it wants to, but but at least they have to show that they're doing it. Uh, the permanent fund dividend is is set aside. I, I think that's a useful. I mean, I understand your point. I agree with your point. Uh, from a, at a certain level, but I think DGF is a very useful designation if it's applied 
consistently and and applied to all things that that uh, that, uh, that 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 qualify for it. Right. The picking and choosing is really probably the most offensive component of that, because again, then it slides it under the radar, and then people are like, "No, you can't do that because the you know we're going to have to take that PFD." Sorry. Uh, and it's not in DGF funds, so we've got you've got no room for wiggle on that. Yeah, exactly right. And and you know I've had these discussions with with members of the media about you know when you say that two thirds of government is being paid for by by permanent fund revenues, that's not that's not accurate because because you has a, have a designation. And they say, well, the legislature doesn't treat it that way. Legislative finance doesn't treat it that way. So we're just we're doing it the way the legislature is treating it. And, and the legislature is treating it wrong. They're violating their own rules. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is it is a little galling sometimes to see legislative finance say, you know, the governor calling out the governor for, for not being truthful, any governor, for not being truthful in budgeting, uh, for not including uh, 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 inflation, the, the correct inflation adjustment, for example. It's a little galling to see legislative finance calling out the governor like that when legislative finance itself is the source of maybe the biggest uh, of all of the of the budget gimmicks by that one slide uh, uh, of a permanent fund division or a permanent fund dividend revenues from DGF over to uh, over to UGF. Yeah, no, I would agree. I would agree with that. And uh, it's been the most galling thing, but that's been our legislature for the last 35 years, 40 years is the budgetary gimmicks. We see it at all levels. Brad, let's move on to number two. Give me a 60-second uh, teaser before we jump into the break. Well, yesterday was uh, was the first hearing on uh, the firing of Angela, Angela Rodell. Uh, this is a broader issue. I think the Permanent Fund Corporation is a broader issue uh, than simply Angela Rodell's uh, firing. I, I think uh, the hearing yesterday highlighted some of that, uh, but I think there's a lot more to go. And frankly, I think the culmination on, uh, of this ought to be significant changes. Uh, in the governance of the of the permanent fund, now that it's become such an important issue, now that the government's drawing from it, now that people are trying to get their hands on it, uh, I think we ought to have some significant changes to how the permanent fund uh, corporation is the board of the permanent fund corporation and how uh, how it's set up to govern the permanent fund. All right, we're back. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're on to number two of the weekly top three. We're talking about uh, the firing of Angela Rodell from the Permanent Fund Corporation and the hearings that were held yesterday. Before you get started, Brad, I got to say the most uh, interesting thing to me on this whole deal is that everybody's crying to the rooftops about how this shouldn't be politicized. This is not a political body. This is not this. This is not that. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to hold hearings and press conferences on it and make it political. Um, I find the irony of that is deep and not delicious at that point. Oh, exactly right. I mean, it is political. It's political on both sides. It, it's it's um, the, the, the permanent fund board is political in its nature. I mean, it's it's appointed by the governor. It's uh, uh, it includes commissioners, uh, uh, two commissioners on it, a commissioner of natural resources and commissioner of, uh, of revenue. Um, it, it is it, it is political in its nature. It is it's it's sort of disingenuous to deny that it is. And and by the same token, it, it, it the yesterday's hearings uh, politicized it as well. I think what this whole episode is doing is is identifying the political nature of all this. Um, and and I think to me, ultimately, the way this plays out uh, is uh, is that we need some changes in in how the permanent fund uh, is governor is governed. In order to depoliticize it, uh, depoliticize it further. The first thing I think uh, needs to be done is I think the commissioners uh, uh, that are appointed by the governor, the directors that are appointed by the governor uh, of the permanent fund board, need to be subject to Senate confirmation. Uh, they're not. Uh, I think I, I've thought that that's been a problem in the past. I've talked about it in the past, uh, and I think the Senate needs to have a periodic review. Uh, of the permanent fund and needs to vet uh, the members of the permanent fund board uh, by uh, making them subject to uh, uh, legislative con confirmation the same way that that uh, that other members of other boards are uh, are as well. Um, the second thing is I think we need to take the commissioners off uh, of the permanent fund board, make them uh, ex officio non-voting advisory members. I think it's useful to have the insights of the commissioner of, uh, of revenue and the commissioner of natural resources when the permanent fund 
uh, is considering uh, its investment policy and other things. Uh, but I think we need to take them off uh, the permanent fund board uh, and make the permanent fund board uh, appointees that are there for their skill and expertise uh, in running an investment uh, uh, fund uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to politicians, frankly, as the commissioners are, uh, as opposed to putting uh, uh, politicians uh, politicians on the board. And I think I think having those commissioners on it uh, helps politicize uh, the board because they're sitting there uh, trying to think about how to run the board, how to run the the fund in a way that is best for the current administration. I mean, that's their job. They're there to, to, to their their commissioners to to help out the administration, to run the administration's policies. And I think putting them on the, on the board uh, uh, politicizes, the, politicizes the board uh, from, the, from the beginning. And the third thing that I think is important, hopefully gets taken up in these hearings, is the thing we talked about last week that was in the Frank Murkowski piece. And that is using board funds to, uh, to invest on the, uh, the in-state side. Um, it started out small, it started out with 200 million, but uh, there's been some discussion about growing the use of the permanent fund um, uh, investments uh, in, on in-state investments. Uh, and as Governor, as, as Governor Hammond himself pointed out at the very beginning, that just set, that's rife with opportunity for, uh, uh, for political usage, favoring some in-state projects over others, favoring campaign donors over others. Uh, all masked by, you know, some verbiage about how, well, it's, it's a good investment opportunity for this, that, or the other reason. Uh, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, picking winners and losers uh, uh, in-state or picking winners and losers because they happen to have jobs, uh, that investment potentially might result in jobs in a certain district or a certain area right. uh, of the state that would benefit benefit the administration. And so I we have we have a uh, 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 part of the government that's set up to do that very thing, ADA, the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority. Uh, it's supposed to, to, you know, focus on in-state investments. We have a group for that. We don't need the permanent fund uh, doing that. We don't need to be using permanent fund uh, monies in that way. And so I think that's the third thing that really ought to be uh, a focus of, uh, of, of changing the governance of the permanent fund uh, corporation going forward. You also sent me this uh, article from Tim Bradner, an opinion piece in the ADN that talks about why we need to drill down into this and figure it out. Um, link that back to the three things you just laid out. Well, Bradner's Bradner saying that uh, uh, we've got a, uh, we've got a situation with the permanent fund corporation that's come up with uh, uh, has been surfaced uh, with the firing of Angela Rodell. We need to dig into that. We need to understand what's going on. I frankly, when I think when I when if they keep digging into that firing, I think they're going to see that part of it was around this whole in-state investment policy that Angela was being resistant uh, to uh, to these in-state investments, and that it was the board, uh, particularly Craig, that's been that's been pushing those. So, I mean, Bradner's Bradner's piece says. We ought to be looking at uh, at these issues. We ought to be digging down into these issues. I agree with that. And and what I'm trying to do is pinpoint for those the three areas in governance, um, uh, who the board uh, confirmation by the legislature uh, take the commissioners off uh, off the board, voting board members themselves, and uh, and banning in state investments. Th those are the specific areas that I think we ought to be digging into. Uh, currently, the theory is the reason she was fired is because uh, the board was somehow a puppet for Dunleavy. They were pushing for an overdraft of the uh, of the five percent of the of the draw, uh, but the board members are on record as supporting the five percent mandate and and everything else. Do you think that's more of a red herring and just kind of obfuscating what's going on? I think that's sort of the surface issue that uh, that everybody jumped to because that's been a uh, a tension point between the administration and uh, and and Angela. She was she was articulating what the board policy was to to hold the five percent uh, uh, withdrawals. I think that's sort of what everybody's jumped to. But I think there's I think there are things going on that are deeper than that, more troubling than that, uh, particularly with with the, with respect to in-state investment pol policy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I think that's just the surface issue. I think. If these if these hearings go forward and as people keep digging into it, I think we're going to find other things that uh, 
that are problematic uh, as well. I, I will say this. I don't think it's a problem that the board asked the ask the ask Angela and and others in the in the in, in the administration of the permanent fund to look at overdraws. I mean, the legislature is talking about it. The governor's talking about it. I think the board ought to inform itself about what the impact of that is. Uh, and I don't think it's troublesome for the for the board to ask the ask Angela to look at that. Yes, it's inconsistent with current policy, but you've got to understand what's going on in the real world. That's what some of the legislature and what the governor's talking about. So you need to inform yourself about what the implications of that are. I think those who are jumping on the on the on the permanent fund board for doing that uh, are going down the the wrong path. Uh, but I do think there are issues there uh, that we need to get our need to get our hands around. Uh, that leads us uh, to number three, but we got about two minutes here, Brad. Do you want to cover to the top? Do you want to go to the next segment? What do you want to do here? I'm going to give you the option. Oh, let me just cover it quickly here, and then let's cover it over the top of the hour, if you if you don't yep, mind. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, so the third one is uh, what's going on with uh, NPRA. Uh, the administra- the Biden administration this past week uh, just uh, uh, announced that they're going back to the Obama rules uh, on NPRA. Uh, which significantly restricts the amount of uh, uh, of area in within NPRA that's uh, that's subject to lease. This back and forth between between rules, uh, what that's really doing is essentially telling investors you can't trust anything. Uh, yes, uh, during during the Trump administration, we broaden we broaden the areas that were going to be subject to lease. We were setting up for a lease sale, but if you get another Democrat administration in there. Uh, it's just going to it's just going to contract again. And and it's not it, it's really not who's in control at any given point in time. It's the uncertainty that those rules will persist over time that really, I think, uh, undermines investment. So outside of the area that the Obama administration cleared for leasing, I think even if we get another Republican administration in there, you're not going to see a rush of investment. It's going to be like Anwar. They may open it up, but but you're just not going to see a rush of private investors looking to uh, to invest in that area because, you know, you put the money out there, you put the, 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 the bids out there. Right. And then it gets closed back up. By it's, the next it's the manufactured uncertainty of what's going on that's causing it to, to pull back. This is something you and I have talked about for the last eight years, seven years, whatever it's been. Um, is this uncertainty factor. Not so much as, you know, pick a plan and stick with it. Even if it's not necessarily great, at least you would have the certainty. But this vacillating back and forth over these things is creating more of the problems in our long-term investment than anything else at this point. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. I mean, think about it from the perspective of a private investor. This is exactly, I mean, this is exactly what we saw in Anwar. From from the standpoint of a private investor, there, there may be a lot of resources there. It may be a great opportunity. But because there's a there's not a consistent government policy about it, one way or the other, uh, they're not gonna they're not gonna invest money there. It, it it is it is a consequence of the partisanship, of the hyper partisanship that we've entered into uh, at the federal government level. And some will blame it on the Democrats, some will blame it on the Republicans. But but the failure to have a bipartisan policy, the failure to work toward the middle. Uh, and develop robust, durable policies um, is 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 having that effect uh, is undermining uh, investment policy. I mean, all you can count on really now uh, with NPRA is is sort of the you know the lowest common denominator, which is which is uh, the Obama policy. That it may swing from that to 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 you know a broader access if the Republicans take control again and then it'll swing back when the Democrats uh, take control again and when you're investing for a 20 year or a 30 year or a 40 year horizon you're not going to invest um, uh, based upon you know whether you're going to be able to access it for for four years or three years or two years by the time they, they get through with the process you're going to say ah, I'm not going I'm not going there so what we what what's really what what would be useful is if we developed a bipartisan policy, a robust policy that had both party buy-ins, um, and and had a durability uh, uh, to it. I think I think Democrats, some Democrats, maybe a lot of Democrats, would be convinced to have a broader access in NPRA. But the problem is the Republicans get a hold of it and they broaden it way out. 
And then the Democrats get a hold of it and they, and they, you know, sort of bounce it, bounce it back. What would really be useful, I think, from our standpoint, from Alaska's standpoint, from the standpoint of gaining investment up here is, is to, is maybe not to get everything that you want to get when, when the Republicans are in office, but try to avoid losing everything you lose when the Democrats are in office and try to get a robust middle ground policy uh, that would that would underpin you know, 25, 30 year investments uh, in the area. <laughs> Boy, you're not asking for much. You're looking for a little middle ground in a day of extremes. I mean, that's kind of where we're at. I mean, it's the back and forth, back and forth. It's always one upsmanship from one side to the other. Um, and that's I think you've just basically sussed out the problem in our governance right now in the United States is this uh, is this uh, extremes. And, the, and those of us in the in kind of in the middle ground are all looking around like, my God, when is the madness? It's like a game at Wimbledon. Your your head is snapping back and forth as the ball goes back and forth across the net. Um, but I mean, hey. it's a nice dream, but I just don't know if, if there's the political will to execute that. Well, I, yeah, in, in this kind, in this environment, maybe not. But I mean, we did see with the with the Infrastructure Act, we did see Republicans and Democrats coming together uh, with respect to with the with respect to the Infrastructure Act, and we saw Mitch McConnell being supportive of that. And so, rather than I think, rather than thinking, oh my gosh, we've got to elect Republicans, and then oh, you know, we'll just open NPRA all the way back up again. Rather than thinking that that ought to be the objective, the objective ought to be to find a way to do what was done on the Infrastructure Act and, and find a middle ground uh, that, uh, that can have a, a policy underpinnings from, from both sides. Alaska is suffering. Alaska in, in, in investment in oil and gas is suffering from, from these political extremes. And Alaska would benefit from getting a, a robust bipartisan middle ground that people will stick to from one administration to the next. It's not a win for Republicans to come in and expand expand the access to NPRA, open it up all the way. That's not a win because investors will not follow that uh, as long as there's the potential that Democrats come back in the next time and, and close it back up. So what would be a win for Republicans and Democrats alike is to find an approach a middle ground approach like we did with the Infrastructure Act uh, that is that is durable from one administration, from, from a Republican administration to a Democrat administration, back to a Republican, back to a Democrat. Well, you don't want much. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're not asking, asking, uh, asking for much right now. But, I mean, I definitely see the point. And, and I've argued the same point over the years that we need to find something that is that everybody can live with and then leave it. Um, and so that we're not constantly with this back and forth, back and forth, whether it's on NPRA, whether it's on Alaska oil taxes or anything else. I mean, everybody needs to benefit from this thing, not just one side or another. And that's the problem. The pendulum has swung so far, like in oil and gas leases and, and, and Alaska oil taxes, it's swung so far from one side to the other with, you know, ELF and the ACEs and all these other different programs that they've tried over the years. We've got to find some middle ground that everybody can live with and that is equitable and then leave it be. Um, and unfortunately, because it's political and because of the polarization that we've seen um, is uh, is a big problem. Although I don't know as your analogy of the infrastructure bill is necessarily a good one because that bill is a hot mess. And, and I don't know how much infrastructure it actually tackles. It seemed like it was a pet project program more than anything else. But I understand your analogy of saying at least they got some bipartisanship out of it. Um, Maybe we should worry when bipartisanship becomes <laughs> at this point. You know, I don't know. Um, all right, Brad. Well, we're out of time for this segment. Thank you for coming on board. Thanks for sticking with us over the top of the hour and uh, giving us your final thoughts on it. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. It's good to, good to talk with you again. Thank you so much, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.